Hey everyone, Victor is here and in this video I want to talk about the bond length rankings and as a little bonus we'll also talk about the bond strength as well, so make sure you stick till the very end. So, here is a fairly common uh, exam question where you have some sort of a monstrosity of a molecule and you need to rank the bond length among some other stuff. You might just have one molecule like in this example, or there may be a bunch of different molecules, doesn't matter. The question is still going to be the same. Rank the indicated bonds uh, according to their length, either from the longest to shortest or the other way around from shortest to longest. And questions like this one might look intimidating, but give me just a few minutes here and I will show you how to deal with them for as long as you remember the core four principles I'm about to teach you. The very first thing here I want to talk about is the atomic size. And despite of what you might have heard before, in organic chemistry the size matters. Not the electronegativity or hybridization or even the shape and geometry of those atoms. Other factors matter too, of course, but bond length is directly proportional to the atomic sizes in the most dramatic fashion. Let me show you what I mean with some concrete examples. So, the hydrogen is the smallest atom imaginable. So, the hydrogen hydrogen bond would be a very short bond. It's only 0.74 angstroms. And for the record, an angstrom is 10 to the negative 10th meter. So, yeah, it is very small. 10 times smaller than even a nanometer that you've used a ton in general chemistry. So, every bond that hydrogen makes to other elements is also going to be comparatively small. For instance, the carbon-hydrogen bond is 1.09 angstrom, the NH bond is 1.02 angstrom, and the OH bond is 0.96 angstrom, so they're all fairly small. But now, how does that compare to, let's say, a carbon-carbon bond? Well, the carbon-carbon bond is 1.53 angstrom, which is quite a significant jump. Carbon is a much larger atom than a hydrogen, so the bond is obviously going to be longer. And we're going to start seeing a similar trend in bond lengthening or shortening if we now start bonding, let's say, carbon to larger or, correspondingly, smaller atoms. So, for instance, a carbon-fluorine bond is 1.35 angstrom as fluorine is a little smaller than the carbon atom. But if I move one square down in the periodic table and look at, let's say, carbon-chlorine bond, that one is already 1.77, because chlorine is a larger atom uh, and it's larger than either carbon or fluorine, like what I had in the previous example. Moving down one more square, where I'm going to have the carbon-bromine bond, and that one is even longer at 1.93 because bromine is, well, a bigger atom. And finally, if I look at the carbon-iodine bond, well, that one is over 2 angstroms, 2.13 to be precise, so that one is quite long. But naturally nobody is going to require you to remember those numbers. The expectation is that you are going to remember the periodic trends from your general chemistry studies. So, if we look at the, what I like to call a relevant periodic table, which only contains elements we typically see in organic molecules, and I'm only listing non-metals here, the element size is going to shrink a little bit as we go from left to right, as we're moving along the period. So, something like, let's say, nitrogen is going to be slightly smaller than carbon because it is to the right from the carbon. Likewise, oxygen is going to be smaller than nitrogen, or fluorine is going to be smaller than oxygen. However, these changes in the size when we are moving along the period, they're not that significant. What is significant, however, is when we are moving down the period, and if we are jumping to the lower periods, that size is going to increase dramatically. So, going left to right is going to be just a small decrease, while going down is going to be a large increase in size. So, with me so far? Okay. Now, let's see how it looks in practice. Here I have a molecule, and let's say we need to rank the highlighted bonds according to their strength. So, here I have a carbon-hydrogen, carbon-carbon, and carbon-oxygen bonds. As I've mentioned before, the bonds with the hydrogen are tiny in comparison, so the CH bond is going to be the shortest one. 
Then we have the oxygen atom that is a little bit smaller than carbon, so we have the CO bond next, and finally we have the carbon-carbon bond here as our longest bond in this example. And if you wanted to double check the numbers, of course, here are the numbers for those bonds, so you can see for yourself what the differences are in the uh, in terms of bond length. All right, so moving on, the next principle I'm going to be talking about here is going to be the bond order. Now, generally speaking, triple bonds are going to be the shortest, the double bonds are going to be a little bit longer, and when it comes to our single bonds, those guys are going to be the longest. And here are the corresponding bond length, the typical bond length. And you're going to see this pattern across the different elements as well. So, for instance, here the carbon-nitrogen bonds, or a set of nitrogen-nitrogen bonds. So you can see the general trend that the triple bond is the shortest, while the single bond is the longest. And naturally, if we take the atomic size into consideration here, we know that the nitrogen is a little bit smaller than carbon, so a nitrogen-nitrogen bond is going to be a little bit shorter than the corresponding carbon-carbon bond, let's say, and we do see that with the numbers that I have over here on this page as well. But while the bond orders are important, we still do need to take into consideration the atomic sizes. So, let me show you what I mean. Here are the numbers for the carbon-oxygen bond, the single and the double bond, and if I compare them to the carbon-sulfur bonds, I can see that even the carbon-sulfur bond is longer than the carbon-oxygen single bond. My carbon-sulfur bond right over here is sitting at 1.61 angstrom, while the carbon-oxygen bond over here, the single bond, is sitting at 1.42 angstrom. So the double bond is actually longer than a single bond in this case. And that is literally because sulfur is a much larger element compared to the oxygen, so even the double bond is going to be fairly long. Of course, this is not going to be a very fair comparison to see something like that on the test, as we don't normally require you to memorize the bond lengths, but this is something that I want you to keep in mind for the tricky questions that your instructor might want to throw your way or something of that sort that not everything is as simple as we make it sound when discussing these trends. Just because double or triple bonds are generally shorter than single bonds, that's not always going to be the case, and the atoms that make up those bonds, they do matter. Now, since we have added this new principle to our arsenal, let's look at an example. And like in the previous example, here are the highlighted bonds that we are going to be ranking here. In this case, we are looking at the carbon-carbon double bond, carbon-carbon single bond, CH bond, CO double bond, and the carbon-carbon triple bond. And since the atomic size is the more important factor, the CH bond, in this case the carbon-hydrogen bond, is going to be our shortest. Then we are going to have the triple bond, followed by the carbon-oxygen double bond, then we have a carbon-carbon double bond, and finally the longest bond in this set is going to be a single carbon-carbon bond. And here are the numbers like in the previous example for your reference, so you can check your uh, rankings based on the experimental data. So, the atomic size and the bond order are the two major principles we are going to be using uh, when we are dealing with the bond length rankings in general. But there are, however, two more aspects of the molecular structure that we absolutely do need to consider. First of all, hybridization has some influence on the bond length. When it comes to the orbital sizes, the sp3 orbital is the largest, followed by the sp2 orbital, and then we have the sp p orbital, which is going to be the smallest. Naturally, this will affect the bond length, with the sp3 hybridized atoms making longer bonds than, let's say, sp2 hybridized atoms that are going to be slightly shorter, and the sp hybridized atoms going to be making the shortest bonds, if everything else is the same, of course. But as I've mentioned before, this is not as big of a factor as the atomic size or the bond order. So, as you can see with the numbers, the effect of the hybridization is there, but it is not as drastic. 
And lastly, one other thing that we need to keep in mind, that is going to be the resonance. So, for instance, here I have the butadiene molecule. And if we draw the minor resonance contributor for this butadiene looking like this, we would be able to draw a hybrid uh, for the butadiene, which we can represent with those partial bonds, something of that sort. So the bond that we have right over here in the middle, that is not really a single carbon-carbon bond, but it is not a carbon-carbon double bond either. So the experimental value for that bond is going to be somewhere around 1.47 angstrom, which is not as long as the uh, single bond, but it is not quite as short as a double bond either. So, once you've outlined your rankings based on the atomic sizes and bond orders, always check for the hybridization differences and any applicable resonance, which may or may not be the case. And also remember that the hybridization and resonance are often intertwined. And if you need a refresher on that, I do have a dedicated video that you should check out if you uh, want to review how the uh, hybridization and the resonance work together. Now, remember this guy from the very beginning of the video? Now we are ready to work through this example. So let's do it. So my atom A which is right over here, is this nitrogen, and because this nitrogen can participate in resonance with the carbonyl, that is going to be an sp2 hybridized species. And because of that resonance, we are going to be seeing the trigonal planar geometry for this atom. Now, my atom B, which is the oxygen right over here, that one is also an sp2 hybridized uh, species, which does have the electronic geometry of the trigonal planar species, However, we do have two electron pairs on that oxygen, which we don't really see, so we don't really have any uh, observable geometry on that oxygen because it's just literally connected to one other atom and that's it. Next, my atom C, which is this carbon over here. Now, the important thing about that carbon is to remember that we do have an implicit hydrogen sitting on that carbon. So we have four different electron groups connected to that carbon, meaning that that is going to be an sp3 hybridized species with a tetrahedral electronic and observable geometry. And finally, my atom D, which is this nitrogen over here. Now, that nitrogen is not next to any double bonds, it is not going to be participating in any resonance or anything, so we do have one, two, three bonds on the nitrogen, we do have the electron pair on that nitrogen, which does mean that this nitrogen is indeed going to be sp3 hybridized with tetrahedral electronic geometry, but because we have an electron pair which we don't see, the observable geometry is going to be trigonal pyramidal. And finally, we have our bond lengths. We have bond number one, number two, number three, number four and number five over here. So my bonds are, the bond number one is a nitrogen-hydrogen bond. The bond number two that we have, that one is a carbon-carbon, but one other thing that I want to point out here that both of those carbons are sp2 hybridized, so actually we have a uh, partial, uh, single partial bo double bond there because we are going to be seeing the resonance in that aromatic ring. Now, my bond number three, that is the carbon-oxygen double bond, which is also a part of the carboxylic acid functional group, so there will also be some resonance going on there, which is going to make that bond a little bit longer than a regular carbon-oxygen bond. Bond number four is going to be a single carbon-carbon bond, but one of those carbons is sp2 hybridized, while the other one is sp3 hybridized, so in comparison it means that it's going to be a little bit shorter than a regular carbon-carbon bond, but not as short as a, let's say, resonance-stabilized bond that we have between two sp2 hybridized atoms. And finally, my uh, bond number five, that is going to be a regular 
carbon carbon bond so this is an sp3 hybridized atom on both ends so that one is going to be a classic single carbon carbon bond so since we know that hydrogen bonds anything that hydrogen is connecting to is going to be a very short bond this bond over here nh bond is going to be our shortest bond so i'm going to put my number one right over here to the shortest bond then we have a double bond and partially double bond so the carbon oxygen double bond that we have over here is going to be our next shortest so i am going to say that this is my number three and the bond between two sp2 hybridized carbons that one is going to be my middle ground so that one is going to be right over here finally i have two single bonds i have a carbon carbon single bond and another carbon carbon single bond and the only difference between those is the hybridization of one of those carbons because i have one of the carbons sp2 hybridized that bond is going to be a little bit shorter so that is going to be my number four right there and then the uh, longest bond the uh, regular carbon carbon single bond here is going to be the longest bond in this set so i'm going to put it right over there next to the longest so yeah it does take a little bit of practice to juggle all of those uh, factors but once you practice for a little bit that is going to become fairly easy so uh, for as long as you're doing a little bit of practice you should be able to crack those questions quite easily for as long as you remember that bond order and the atomic sizes are the two most important things then the hybridization and resonance are two things that can modify the bond length making it a little bit longer or a little bit shorter but not as much as the size uh, of the atoms themselves and the bond order meaning the single double triple bonds now remember i told you about a little bonus at the end well it turns out that when it comes to the bond strength the bond strength and the bond length are correlated with each other and the shorter the bond is the stronger the bond is generally but there is of course a caveat this relationship only holds when you are comparing bonds of the same bond order or bonds made out of the similar atoms so for instance let's look at the carbon carbon single double and triple bonds we know that the single bond is the longest and the triple bond is the shortest likewise if we look at the bond dissociation energies we'll see that the single bond is the weakest and the triple bond is the strongest Similarly, if let's say we look at the carbon-nitrogen bonds, we are going to see the same trend where the uh, bond lengthwise, the carbon-nitrogen single bond is going to be the longest, the carbon-nitrogen triple bond is going to be the shortest, and from the perspective of the bond strength, we are going to see that the carbon-nitrogen triple bond is the strongest, while the single bond is the weakest. But now, let's throw a CH bond into this mix, shall we? Well, that that bond is quite short we are sitting at 1.09 angstrom and if we look at the energy of that bond well we are going to see something very interesting it is not anywhere as strong as other bonds of the same length uh, that we are seeing on this page likewise let's say a hydrogen hydrogen bond well that guy is only 0.74 angstrom that bond is tiny and yet energy wise it is almost the same as carbon hydrogen bonds so as you can see the relationship only holds when you are comparing similar bonds between similar atoms good news is though that you are not going to be seeing any of those tricky comparisons on the test or at least i hope not because generally speaking that's not what we see on the tests and the hardest type of a question that you are most likely going to see is the one that I had on the previous uh, page, this guy. So now, make sure you do plenty of practice problems and you'll be ready for the next exam. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below, boop the like button if you learned something new today, and as always, thank you for watching and I will see you next time!